A man would burn off his fingertips in order to prevent being caught. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Brenda Bowen. Viewer discretion is advised. Brenda Joyce Breckenridge, she was born on March 27th, 1952, and it appears she lived her entire life in Alabama. At some point, she meets a man named Jerry Bowen. The two of them hit it off, and they get married, and they have two children together. They have Jason and Ginger. They had been married for 19 years, but by 1995, they decided to get a divorce. Jerry had started to become unfaithful. He had started seeing another woman, and he asked Brenda for divorce, which she agreed to. It was, for the most part, a very amicable divorce. There was no anger involved in any of it. Jerry would continue living in on the property so they owned a house and, and this was in westover alabama but there was also a guest house just on, on the property and so jerry would move into the guest home jerry also agreed to give pretty much most of the assets to brenda without any argument it remained fairly amicable until about 1997 when jerry apparently ran into some money problems and he confronted her one night and said, listen, we need to get back together, not for love or anything, but for business reasons, for financial reasons, for him. But she told him, like, I don't want to live this lie of a life. Like, I, we're, we're not in love anymore. We're not a happy couple. I don't want to do that. But she told him, just let me think about it, though. And apparently when she said that, he became super pissed off and he stormed out of the house. And he screamed at her, fine, I will just take you back to court then. And Brenda told all of this to her father, James, and she said that she just saw nothing but hatred in Jerry's eyes and nothing but hatred in the way he was talking to her. Four days later, out of nowhere, Brenda disappears. Brenda was supposed to attend a prayer meeting with some friends of hers, and that was on January 28th, 1997. Sometime after 12 p.m., her friends that she was supposed to go to this prayer meeting with, they go to Brenda's home to see if she's okay. But when they get there, Brenda is nowhere to be found. The door's open, or the door's unlocked. They enter the home. Nobody's home at the time. Not even Jerry's not in the guest home. Nobody's there. We would later find out that the last person to see Brenda was her daughter, Ginger, at approximately 7.30 in the morning. But after that, nobody can recall seeing Brenda. Brenda's clothes were laid out on the bed as she did every morning. That's, you know, she was going to get ready and get dressed. She had her jewelry all set out on the dresser to wear that day. That's what she, that's what her normal thing was. Her curling iron was in the bathroom. It was plugged in and it was turned on as if she was in the middle of getting her hair ready. I, I guess according to the kids, the only thing that seemed to be missing of Brenda's were her pajamas and that was it. So it's likely she was wearing the pajamas when whatever happened to her happened to her. Everything in Brenda's life was going amazing. She was happy despite the divorce. She was happy. She had two teenage kids that were really, really good kids, well-behaved, never got into trouble. She raised them right. And she had this beautiful home with a guest house. And it was just, there was no signs that she would ever just pick up and just abandon all of it. And especially not her children. And police would interview the family, the friends, and they all said, we can't see anything, any reason why Brenda would just make herself disappear. Her car was missing, so did she get into her car and just take off? But again, unusual behavior, it is a possibility. But her family knew deep down that something was wrong, that something happened to Brenda, and they all basically immediately began pointing fingers at Jerry, her ex-husband. They tell police that her and Jerry had gotten divorced. The divorce was perfectly fine and normal. There was, it was content. And, but recently there was this thing where Jerry needed money. He tried to get back with Brenda and he was really mad when Brenda wasn't really going along with it. And then four days later, suddenly she's gone. Jerry was completely cooperative though with police. He was nothing but 
helpful to them in terms of answering questions. And Jerry would ask a detective, well, what do you think happened to Brenda? And the detective said, well, let's just hope she's just somewhere on a beach in Florida. You know, let's just hope she needed to get away for a while and made herself kind of disappear, but she'll be back safe and sound. But then the detective says, Jerry looks at him dead in the face and says, no, you're wrong. She's dead. And the detective's like, okay, well, if she's dead, where is she? Where can we find her? And Jerry would say, probably in a body of water somewhere nearby. They search all over town. They search in, because there's a lot of wooded areas over in that area. And they search through that. They comb through the nearby bodies of water. And initially they don't find anything. One person who was never present during any of the searches for Brenda was Jerry. Jerry was completely flippant about the entire thing. He didn't seem to care. He made, he was not crying. He wasn't emotional. Again, that doesn't always mean that they're guilty of something, but it is just something that people look at and go, hmm, that's kind of odd. But people do react in different ways. You never know how you're going to react to a situation until it happens. So sometime, I think the night they started the investigation or the next day or something like that, they actually would find Brenda's car. And it was 200 feet off Shelby Road, which is about five miles or so from her home. Her purse and her like, you know, wallet and little belongings were all in her purse, all on the passenger side seat. Nothing was taken from it. There was no broken windows, no signs of a struggle struggle in the car, no blood, no hair fibers, nothing. What they did find strange was that the car seemed to be completely wiped down of fingerprints because they found not one single print anywhere. Brenda's son, Jason, asked them also, where was the seat, like the, the, the vehicle seat, the driver's seat, where was it positioned? And they told him, well, it was pushed all the way back. And this is something that these like kidnappers and criminals and murderers never think to ever, ever do to like fix. But Brenda was five foot two. The, the position of the seat, there was just no physical way possible she could have reached the pedals from where the seat was positioned. However, Jerry was tall enough and he could reach the pedals. But like I said, I swear to God, killers and who, whatever the case may be, they never think to go, oops, maybe I should move the seat back, you know? Idiots. But they ruled out robbery because obviously the person just left the car, her purse and money and everything was still in it, and Brenda was still nowhere to be found. Police believe that the car was purposefully placed in this position to throw them off, to make it look like Brendan might be found in that area, but the actuality is that she wasn't found anywhere in that area. And then all of a sudden, Jerry, kind of out of nowhere, appears at the crime scene where the car was found, and he asks police a very specific question. He says, is that the car that belongs to the missing woman? Not, is that my ex-wife's car? Not, is that Brenda's car, but the missing woman? But also, he knows the car she drives. He would recognize the car immediately. So the way he phrased that was just super strange. Could just be a simple slip of the tongue. You know, again, it's just maybe a reactive thing. But again, it just seemed kind of odd, an odd question. Jerry was taken into the police station because they wanted to interview him formally. And apparently he was, at that point, completely uncooperative. He wasn't really answering their questions and he actually falls asleep in this interview. He fell asleep and he showed, again, no emotion. He just did not seem to care that Brenda was missing. But every time he mentioned Brenda, it was always in the past tense. And that's another slip that killers and will do is they want, it's one of those things you just don't think about, but they know that a person is dead. And so they, they refer to them in the past tense while everyone else still refers to them in the current tense because they don't know that the person is dead. Jerry's friends, and he also had a girlfriend because like I said, he started dating another woman. They all said that he was very emotional about this. He did care a lot about it. He showed emotion to them, but he sh never showed emotion to the police or Brenda's family. They actually would have Jerry take down all, basically off all of his clothes down to his underwear, and they wanted to see if he had any scratches or marks on his body, bruises. Not one single scratch, not bru no bruises, nothing. So that just indicated that if he did do something to Brenda, she may have been incapacitated by the time he actually physically harmed her or she just didn't fight back. The detectives admittedly were very focused on Jerry and Jerry alone. They didn't really look at any other angle or any other possible suspects. They didn't look at this as a potential home invasion gone wrong. They didn't really look into anything else. It was pretty much just in their eyes. It was Jerry who did this and we need to find the proof that he did. But we also need to find Brenda. 
Two months later, after Brenda is reported missing, she is finally found. March 29th, 1997, there are some fishermen fishing along the Coosa River in nearby Childersburg, Alabama. And all of a sudden, this, what looks like a long package kind of pops up to the surface and they realize that it's a body sized package and they have a feeling that there's a body inside but they call police and when police arrive they do manage to they first take photos of everything they open it and they can confirm that there is a body of a woman in there Uh, she is pretty badly decomposed but eventually dental records would confirm that this was the body of brenda bowen And obviously, she had been murdered because you don't end your own life and then put yourself into a a sheet and wrap her up with ropes and then put yourself in the river. So her body had been wrapped in a green sheet and then the sheet was uh, tied up with some nylon ropes. Something they noticed immediately that was very peculiar about this was that it was tied up with three different types of knots. A bowline knot a slip knot, and a square knot. And the tips of the ropes had been burned off what, by what may have been a cigarette. And Jason, Brenda's son, said when he, he asked police, like, hey, can I see the image of the, the ropes? And when he saw the photo of how it was tied up, he said he immediately began to cry. He goes, I know exactly who tied those. That was That's Jerry. Jerry did that. Jerry was an outdoorsman. He did a lot of outdoor stuff. Um, He did a lot of hunting, hiking, and he did a lot of things that involved ropes. And Jason said, I saw Jerry tie those exact three knots on one thing dozens of times. And he always burned off the tips of the nylon ropes he used to tie up things with, with a cigarette. So the way it was tied up, the fact that the car's the driver's seat was pushed all the way back, the burned ends of the ropes and all that, it was enough circumstantial evidence for them to go, okay, we got you, Jerry, we know this was you. They couldn't determine 100% how Brenda died because of how badly her body was decomposed, but they speculated that she was likely suffocated, strangled, maybe, possibly even was drowned. They think Jerry did it because of this whole wanting to get back together for financial reasons. Brenda wasn't on board with it and he just snapped and killed her. The evidence against Jerry though was purely circumstantial. There was not a single shred of actual physical evidence like no DNA, no fingerprints, touch DNA, nothing. There was no physical evidence, just the fact that Jerry was known to tie those knots, just known to burn off the rope, and the vehicle seat was pushed all the way back where Brenda couldn't have driven the car. His unusual behavior also factored into it. He also had no alibi uh, on the morning that she, they believe she was murdered that morning, sometime after 7.30 a.m. and before 9.30 a.m. He could not, with any anything at all, account for his whereabouts for that time frame. People had gone to the house at around uh, 8 or 9 in the morning for some reason, and even Jerry wasn't at his, in the guest house. He wasn't there at all. On April 17th, 2000, Jerry goes on trial for the murder of Brenda Bowen. There are about 30 witnesses who testify against him, and it was pretty signed, sealed, delivered for the jury. They found him guilty on all charges, and he was going to be awaiting his sentencing. I told a similar story actually recently where the same thing happened where a person was found guilty of murder and in that story and in this story this guy was released on bond $150,000 bond and was allowed to be free until his sentencing hearing. On June 20th 2000 the day of his sentencing hearing his sister Jerry's sister got an email that said quote this may be a dumb move on my part sis but I don't feel I should serve time for a crime I didn't commit therefore I am running and he fled. He uh became a wanted fugitive. Police go to his house to to check to see if there's any signs of where he may have gone. They actually check his computer and in the interim of time when he was home after the trial and the sentencing, he had been on his computer a whole bunch of times looking up very graphic, pornographic images, uh, images of women being strangled and choked to death, uh, women being killed. It was very, very disturbing and incredibly graphic. He was looking up things like cannibalism and stuff like that. Jerry would be sentenced in absentia, even though he was missing, and he was sentenced to life from prison, but they didn't have Jerry to put into a jail cell. There had been sightings of him in Florida, in Wyoming, and various other places, but at first nobody 
knew where he was. On December 21st, 2004, a person was watching a re-airing of an Unsolved Mysteries episode. This, the one that talked about this case because he was a wanted fugitive. And she goes, I immediately recognized that man as her sister's boyfriend, a man named Steven Starbuck. So police go there and they find this guy, Steven Starbuck, and he looks very similar to Jerry Bowen. He gave him a driver's license, a birth certificate with his name, and they said, all right, we're gonna take your fingerprints. And so he gives them his fingerprints and they determine that it's not really a match to Jerry Bowen, which was weird. But then someone noticed the tips of all of his fingerprints were like, w there was a weird pattern or it was like almost smooth. When you look at his fingers, his fingertips had all been like burnt burnt off. They later found out that he dipped his fingertips in acid for several minutes to burn the tips off. But when the fingerprint guy looked at the rest of the print, like underneath, it was a match. It was Jerry's. They couldn't confirm it 100% because they didn't have his fingertips anymore. But Jerry, when confronted with this, would eventually say, okay, it's me. I'm Steven Starbuck. Steven Starbuck was actually, I guess, a homeless man he met. He stole the homeless man's identity. He actually had been using a different name at first named Richard Bassett, another homeless man. I guess that homeless guy died and it became difficult for him to use that identity. And so he moved on to another person named Steven Starbuck. He was in, at this point, North Charleston, South Carolina. But police finally had him. He confessed it was him. He still denies he had anything to do with Brenda's murder, but he was convicted of the murder regardless and sentenced to life in prison. He also would end up pleading guilty to uh, evading police, uh, basically becoming a fugitive. He also pled guilty to multiple charges of uh, identity theft, uh, possession of a weapon, and... So I guess he was sentenced to life in prison, but he was, in the end, given the option for parole. Like, he could be paroled. However, he won't be eligible for parole until this uh, March of 2026. And he is still rotting away in a prison cell, hopefully for the rest of his life. Well, I guess maybe if he didn't do it, maybe not hopefully the rest of his life. But even though there wasn't physical evidence to say he did it, I don't know. I just, like, I feel like he did it. I, I, I don't... I. I don't know, it just seemed like he's the one. But that's where he is now, he's in prison. So hopefully, Brenda Bowen and her family, hopefully they got the correct justice. And hopefully it was the justice that Brenda rightfully deserved. But... That is it for this case, True Crime, a Rooney, Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, please subscribe, give this video a like, follow me over on my two TikTok pages. They are listed in the link tree in the description of this video below. The links also pop up here at the beginning and the end of the video. I tell short form true crime stories over there. I also have a merch store in the link tree below. We have like t-shirts and hoodies and stuff. We do ship all over the entire world, so feel free to check it out if you want. And then lastly, if there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a really quick email. Uh, my email is listed below. Just send me the name of the case, where it happened, when it happened. I'll add it to the list. It's over 6,200 names long. I pick my cases at random. I'll get to your case eventually. I just can't promise you when. But that is it for this video. True crime. Stop it. Okay. We will see you for the next video and story. So until then, try try for now. True crime. Rooney dooney 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 dingleberry dongle dinga dongle dongles. Mm-hmm.